Hello, everybody. Long time no Zoom, Evan. Hey, another day, another Zoom. That's right. Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. Sam McCune along with Evan Bland. We are two weeks out from the season opener uh, for Nebraska and uh, in Ohio State. I still haven't quite figured out how we're going to do the podcast the day before the Nebraska-Ohio State game because I'm probably going to Ohio State. I think they're only going to let, like, one reporter per, per group in. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll still we'll figure that out. We'll do it on the Thursday before or something like that. We also need to have sort of a bigger roundtable, I think, hopefully next week where uh, maybe in the middle of the week where we can have every you know, a few people on there just to kind of talk about the predictions for the season. But uh, – yeah, how you doing, Evan? We've we've done a lot of zooming this week. A um, couple hours worth with Nebraska football coaches. You did one with Will Bolt. We're just zooming all over the place. I, I was just thinking that this is my fourth Zoom day in a row, and maybe for a lot of people, that's just par for the course or not anything. But I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a lot of Zoom for me, and the it's it been it's been interesting doing the football practices. I was thinking yesterday we actually had to wait for the players for like the first time, so they're really starting to become more realistic too to what a an in practice uh, or in a person practice experience would be like. Everything's been on time up until yesterday. Um, you know, I think Nebraska's done a good job with the zooms. Um, I've been impressed with um, just the the quality of the questions, and I think the assistants are probably getting you know, a little bit deeper questioning than maybe sometimes they would during the course of a season. Sometimes those guys will talk for four or five minutes and, you know, it's like, what's your favorite takeout meal? Or, um, you know, tell us about some, you know, random third stringer that's probably not going to play, but whatever. And it feels like it's been a little bit more zeroed in and focused. And so I feel like we've heard um, they. Sam froze up on us here. But I think what he's saying is, is absolutely true as he comes back here that the questions, it, everyone's been in on the same calls, right? So instead of a typical season where you have a coach up front, kind of in front of the cameras, usually the coordinator, um, and then the assistants off to the side, maybe some of the players, uh, it, it's a situation where everyone kind of gets their chance in the spotlight. And so typically these post practices might take, you know, 20 minutes because all the interviews are occurring simultaneously. Uh, you might have to move around and try to just kind of get little bits and pieces from different people. Uh, what you're seeing now is basically an hour to 70 minute sessions where um, everyone gets the same stuff. Everyone's kind of sharing in that dialogue. So it's definitely a unique type of situation. Welcome back, Sam. I'm back. All right, we're just going to keep rolling. Not sure what happened there with my uh, Wi-Fi, but I, I think it went uh, a wi- awry, awry Wi-Fi for a minute. Uh, we'll get into what we'll, – we'll start with the quarterbacks in a minute. I want to let everybody know that our sponsor is the Team Schwabach. Team Schwabach is a family-owned uh, all-state insurance agency with four licensed insurance pros saving thousands of Nebraska Husker fans money. They sell homeowner, auto, life, and flood insurance across Nebraska. They also insure all the big boy toys just two weeks left of your big boy toys uh, to be using those before uh, you got Nebraska football. Motorcycles, boats, RVs, off-road vehicles. This might be the last warm weekend of the year. If you've had your roof replaced in the last five years, give Joe Schwabach, Kyle Schwabach, Nancy Mostek, or Kyle Murdoch a call at 402-590-5200. They can help you save a bundle. Free no obligation insurance reviews and quotes are going to make sure all their fellow Nebraska fans are properly protected you can contact them at 402-590-5200 or www.nebraskaallstate.com, www.nebraskaallstate.com. Thank you for Team Schwalbach, the Schwalbach Agency. Okay. So, um, let's start with the quarterbacks. Um, we heard from both Adrian Martinez and Luke McCaffrey yesterday. We heard from quarterbacks coach Mario Verdusco, who had some some choice lines but didn't didn't offer up a lot. Uh, in terms of what's actually going on with the, with the quarterback battle. Um, Evan, you wrote about the two quarterbacks yesterday. Uh, I'll throw this to you. What did you hear from Verdusco, Martinez, and McCaffrey? What do you feel like you heard from them? Um, not just what they said, but what you think, uh, what, what you gleaned from it. Right. So, you know, I, I think, first of all, it was important to kind of go into the day with an understanding of what had been said previously right so like Matt Lubick last week saying it was a friendly competition Adrian Martinez is the starter right now Um, you know you you heard some of the 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 coaches on defense 
earlier in the week, uh, talking kind of about both of them as, as, a, as a pair. They're, they're both operating better. They're both making better decisions, things like that. So we hadn't really heard a lot of separation. And, and you're right, you know, Verduzco, I thought, was pretty, pretty noncommittal. I mean, and, and obviously we all know what kind of guy he is. He's a very friendly, talkative guy. But I thought it was notable that any questions comparing Adrian Martinez and Luke McCaffrey, he was, he was pretty short and to the point with. You know, not unfriendly or anything, but just like, yeah, you know, just just kind of really uh, shortened his answer. So he, he wasn't too intent on uh, breaking that down at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I thought that Luke McCaffrey was was pretty well spoken. I thought his line about him calling himself still a young guy on the team and knowing when to be vocal and knowing when to defer um, – was notable in that he's still kind of settling in as that guy and, and he's still a redshirt freshman, right? He's 19, I think 19 years old right now. So he still has some growing up to do. Um, and then I think Martinez, the last question uh, that, that you asked him gave the best answer of the day. Um, basically accepting that there is a competition, right? Like he could have, he could have said, I'm the guy. He could have said a lot of different things, but he acknowledged it. And I thought the most, uh, interesting part in terms of showing his maturity was how he said, look, maybe this competition is, is just what's meant to be as I progress as a quarterback. I mean, a lot of, of lesser mature, um, maybe less self-aware people would, would be, you know, upset by that, could be rattled by that, um, could be defensive, whatever it might be. He said, yeah, you know, he's Luke's pushed me. I'm probably, I'm better for it. Um, and so I thought that was notable that, that while Martinez uh, appears like he's still in line to be that guy this year, I think um, he is embracing kind of what's going on behind him. And, and ultimately it's maybe making everybody better. Yeah. I thought I, you know, I would say that, that um, I'll, I'll preface this with a few thoughts. Like, first of all, I still think Adrian Martinez is the starter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think um, the idea that you're going to, you're going to put a guy that's never started a football game um, out as a starter at Ohio State, um, and 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 assume that that tone's going to be the, the tone you want to set. Uh, it just doesn't it doesn't track with me. Um, it, it, certainly, it's possible to unseat a, set, a two year starter. I think it would be very hard to do that given the the first game. Um, you know, so I think obviously Martinez uh, is is probably going to head out there against o- Ohio State, and probably going to head out there against. Um, Wisconsin. I mean, regardless of what happens with Ohio State, um, I think McCaffrey may get some playing time. That's that's entirely possible. But uh, but I think Martinez is you know the wise pick to start. Um, not necessarily because he's a better player, but because he has the experience and he will uh, you know he'll be the guy that you want to send in to to play uh, the big bad wolves of the Big Ten. Um, I guess I'll start with McCaffrey. I when I listen to Luke, uh, I get it. I get a I get a good vibe, in the sense that um, he seems very competitive, uh, and and uh, maybe a little bit of a chip on his shoulders, which is not, which is not uncommon. Uh, when you're when you're the youngest brother, and he is, uh, he you know he has a bunch of older brothers. I you know I think his second oldest brother is Dylan, and you know I think if you're talking about who uh, Dylan was always older than Luke. And I think he was the quarterback and Luke was the guy that was going to be the quarterback. And, and, and so I think there's Luke probably has a pretty good chip on his shoulder and that's okay. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I, I just get the sense with him that there's a real zeal to compete and there's a real zeal to compete at quarterback. Um, and that that's a position he wants very much. Um, I think he tries to give the right answer or what he thinks the right answer is going to be. And that's usually indicative of a young guy who wants to do the right thing and wants to say the right thing. As time goes on, I think you learn a little bit more about yourself. And like Martinez said yesterday, you, you start to live in and press in a little bit more who you really are. And I think what we heard from Martinez yesterday was a little bit more who he really is. Like, I mean, I, I think, you know, he was able to say, you know, I think with Martinez, he's a pretty cool, cool hand, uh, level-headed guy. Uh, doesn't freak out, um, probably grew up that way, given his circumstances, you know, with his mom passing early, he had to kind of be the young man of the house and it wasn't always going to be easy. And, 
I think he's probably had to play, a, you know, a, a big brother role in, in people's lives. And so he's probably always been a little bit cooler. He had a cooler head and, and been a little bit more protective and probably needs to get that fire out there a little bit more. And I think you saw that um, yesterday and he admitted that. I think McCaffrey's a little bit different in the sense that he's, you know, he's probably always been the upstart. You know, he's always probably been the guy that's, that's been punching up at his brothers, not in a bad way, but just, you know, when you have older brothers and I do much older, um, there's always a sense of feeling you have to prove something or, or that they don't necessarily respect you or think, think of, think certain things. And so I, I get that from Luke a little bit, um, you know, and, and, and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing to work into. I thought it was notable that he appreciate that he had mentioned Brendan Hymas and having a conversation with him. Hymas is probably the best player on the offense in terms of his NFL stock. And so I think it's notable that he was talking to Hymas about just the season itself. Um, Verduzco is always, you know, Verduzco is, is, is a dutiful man. And so he, he always plays things pretty close to the vest because he feels like that's Scott Frost's decision to make. And Verduzco's job is to coach those guys. He's not necessarily making the determination on who's going to play when. I don't know if you'd ask Mario Verduzco, hey, Mario, do you, do you want to put Luke McCaffrey in on the third to last play of the football game against Iowa? Uh, I don't know that <laughs> I don't, I don't know that would have been his choice. We've, we've never asked him. It's really not his decision to make, so it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know? And I think he's pretty good about that. But at the same time, what that means is Mario's going to talk about wiping down seats and talking about his process and not really talking about who's winning that job. That's just never been his... Um, that's just never been his MO while he's been at Nebraska. So, um, I've, I've kind of stopped asking him questions about, uh, quarterback competitions. And I think you have to really pick your battles when you, when you ask him a question about how a quarterback's doing, um, because you, you want to get a very specific answer. And sometimes you do, but a lot of times it's very broad and, you know, he wants to make sure that he's protecting the, the privacy, the, the, the coach player relationship, in a way that's, you know, uh, protects the player and protects him and things like that. And so, I don't know. Like, the biggest question mark that you have with McCaffrey, and it's to some degree it's a question mark with Martinez too, is you put a guy in a shotgun, you're 80 yards away from a touchdown. Go win the game. Can you throw, can you complete eight, nine passes in a row to do that? Do you feel like you can you can move a football team down the field in that setting? Do you feel like, okay, you're up 14, 10, going into the second half, get the ball to start the third, gotta put the foot on the gas, gotta put one on the board. Let's get let's get eleven, let's get two scores clear of them and kind of put them in a tough spot midway through the third quarter. Do you know how to will that to happen? Do you know how to get a third and four? whether it's running or throwing the football, um, can you make that touch pass on third and four? Can you do those things? And we just haven't seen McCaffrey have enough opportunities to do that at the collegiate level to really know. I mean, he did it um, to some degree against Indiana. He had a nice two-minute drive there. Um, but you just don't know. And, and I think that's the piece. And with Martinez, it's the same way. Can Martinez consistently do that? Can he be the guy that – you know, they had a chance to go beat Purdue, and they, they weren't able to do it. Uh, they had a chance to finish off Colorado last year, and they weren't able to do it. They had a chance to, to beat Iowa last year, tie score, tie game, uh, ball with a minute left, and they couldn't do it. Uh, that wasn't all those quarterbacks' fault. In fact, I would, I would wager that it wasn't necessarily mostly their fault or even the majority of their fault. But, you know. The final drive against Iowa, that's Martinez's moment, and they, they inserted another quarterback to, to run I don't even know what. And we, it's still unclear what, what that play was supposed to be. I guess a deep pass. Um, as a quarterback, you know, if you're Martinez, that's got to sting you a little bit. That's got to bother you. So I think there's still big question marks about both of them in those kind of settings, and neither one of those questions may be answered against Ohio State, although what you would love to see when they go play Ohio State is a kind of stand-up performance that says we're not we're not going to back down from these guys even if we don't win um, we're not going to back down. We saw that in 2018 for Martinez in 2019 we did not. Um, he struggled. Everyone else struggled too, and so on and so forth. But 
Um, that, that's kind of that's kind of what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm I feel like I'm hearing a more mature Martinez. I feel like I'm hearing a McCaffrey that is very, very motivated and very competitive. Um, and we'll just have to kind of see how it plays out. There were uh, there were a number of questions about um, running backs, and then Scott Frost talking about wide receivers. What did you hear about the running backs? And then what do you feel like you're hearing about Omar Manning? Right. <clears throat> well, you know, we, we talked about that this week a little bit with the running backs. Um, you know, Ryan Held pretty much went through his room this week on Zoom and, and broke it down. And, um, you know, it wasn't a surprise with the ones. Obviously, Diedrich Mills is that guy. Held called him the bell cow. He's going to be the guy who takes the majority of the snaps. That's no no shocker there. But I think, um, and and I, I think we agree on this generally, that the way that he spoke about everybody else would kind of lead you to believe that they don't really have a good sense of that number two or number three guy at this point. Or, you know, God forbid, Meek Mills goes down with an injury of some kind, who that next guy up would be. I don't feel like they have a strong grasp on that. You know, they like Tompkins. They like Ronald Tompkins. Um, he's obviously showing them more than uh, maybe it appeared that he could because of his uh, previous knee injuries. He's coming back strong, but they've mentioned they want to keep him on a pitch count, so to speak. Um, but, you know, beyond that, they, they he just kind of ran through the list. It's, it's Ramir Johnson. It's the freshman, Marvin Scott, Sevian Morrison. Uh, throws out a couple uh, walk-ons like Zach Winemaster and, and Cooper Jewett. And, uh, you know, his line at the end I thought was the most telling, which is like, yeah, we're two weeks away. We need to start narrowing this thing down. You know, Wandale Robinson is not walking through that position uh, room door right now. He's going to be, you know, in the slot or as a receiver. So uh, I think what we, what we, what I heard was Mills and then um, we'll figure it out later. And then in terms of, of, of Manning, it's been interesting. I think like not just this week, but last week over the summer, anytime, uh, Scott Frost or Matt Lubick uh, have had a chance, or, or Adrian Martinez this week, have had a chance to talk about Manning. Um, it's been somewhat reserved. And I think we, we learned a little bit about uh, how he's gone through some uh, sort of injuries this week. He's had some personal things going on. Uh, they like what he does physically. But whether – I don't know it's, if it's because <clears throat> he's underwhelmed in some capacity or if it's because – they're making a conscious effort to kind of dial back the hype on newcomers. But for whatever reason, uh, it feels like talk about him has been tempered. They like his potential. Um, it's clear he'll be a part of what they do this year, but it has not been the type of gushing praise maybe that we've heard from newcomers in the past, um, or maybe that has matched up with kind of his recruiting hype and, and the rankings that have gone with that. So uh Maybe it's not the worst thing in the world that he can come in and, and kind of have a little bit of a lower expectation to start. But I do think it's notable, given kind of his background, uh, that we really haven't heard much in the way of praise for him so far. Yeah, I think it's a little bit concerning. Yeah. Um, maybe not totally concerning, but a little bit. And, you know, I, it's just hard to tell uh, exactly how that situation is going to play out. But, you know, um, what I heard from from Frost and a little bit from Martinez is is sort of a, you know, I don't know what you want to call it a um, a thought, you know, a a, a a thoughtful answer. In other words, you know, a, a kind of a kind of uh, well, yeah, he's doing really well. You know, like it it just doesn't sound. It was when you hear broad strokes like that, it, it and you don't hear any specifics. Um, then you wonder a little bit about what's going on. You know, I always try to listen for that specific ear, uh, and I, I don't hear it. You know, I don't hear, well, there's route running, or, you know, he's really good in the red zone, or, you know, he's doing a really good job at blocking, but he's got to work on this. There's, there was really none of that, which means, you know, that there's not a sentence uh, at this moment that you can affix to his play. In other words, it, it what to me, it wasn't just dialing down, um, the, uh, the praise because you can dial down the praise by saying, you know, uh, there's some things we think he can do, but, but, uh, at the same time, he's got to get better at his route running. And, uh, when you hear nothing, and I don't think we heard any real specifics either from Frost or Martinez, no. usually that's, 
something else. Like that's a, you know, we, we want him to, you know, we want him to do well and, 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 uh, we're, we're hoping he's, he's a contributor in game one. That that's what I heard. Like I, I could be reading into it too much, but, but I, I just don't hear, you know, um, usually when you hear criticism, you're hearing for specifics and Ryan Held, for example, gave a lot of those on the running backs. Um, you know, uh, he, he said, you know, three or four good things about Ramir Johnson, but then he said, you know, he's got to work on his footwork and he's got to work on where, where his cuts are. Uh, Marvin Scott's got a senior, you know, got a senior body in the freshman, but, uh, a senior in a freshman's body, but he's got to work on his footwork and he has to work on the mental part of the game. And Sevian Morrison, we didn't really hear, you noticed it was Sevian too. We didn't really hear anything specific. We just heard he's going to be really good. He's going to be great. He's kind of like Marvin. <laughs> like we didn't, we didn't hear a lot of specifics there, which means the progress is still coming. And then with Ronald Tompkins, what we heard is, you know, this guy's got a lot of talent and he's work, he's come back and, and he's done some good things. We got to be safe with him. You know, so it gives you, usually people will give you a little bit of, uh, of room to kind of hear what you're hearing. And based on what I'm hearing about Manning, it's just kind of like, uh, there's not any real specifics to offer up. And that's probably not the best thing. Um, but we'll see. You never know. That could it could it could be one of these deals where it's a where he makes a big jump in the next two weeks. He certainly has the physical ability to do it, and, and he's ready to roll. On the running back front, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like the Dedrick Mills freight train, and then maybe you can bring in a Ramir Johnson and a Ronald Tompkins and maybe a Marvin Scott as a, you know as a breather. But uh, I'm still. I, you know, it's a little surprising to me. I'm not actually, it's not surprising because we've talked about this. It's not that surprising to me that they haven't nailed down a number two or number three running back. One, two, it's a little, it's a little concerning on, on the front of you had these guys, these 2019 recruits who have been there and have been through the system. And one of them played in four games last year and you still haven't nailed him down as the number two. Like, what is that? I mean, they could have easily said, you know, uh, Dedrick Mills is going to be the guy. Uh, you know, after that, I think it's going to be Ramir Johnson. Yeah, hey, you know, we like what he's done, and he still has some things to work on, but he's probably our, he's probably the backup right now. You didn't hear that. No. No, but, but, but you know, they do have more numbers than last year. I mean, think about how thin it was then. I mean, Mills was learning a new system. Johnson was kind of the guy. And then it was like, well, you know, Wandale, I guess. They're, he's, I mean, he was their best back early on, certainly, but he was not where they wanted him to be. Uh, well, he got hurt. He was beat up. He was, yeah. But, you know, again, ultimately they wanted him as a receiver. So, you know, I, I – well, That's because he gets beat up. Yeah, yeah, he's a smaller guy. Yeah. I just – I, I do feel like it'll work itself out. Like, I guess it's, it's mildly concerning that they don't have a number two. I think that, for, first of all, speaks to Mills and how, and really kind of validates how he came on strong that last third of last year. That's fair. I agree. But, but, but also, you know, just in just a simple number scheme, like of all the positions where like somebody's going to break out mid season, I feel like running back is that spot, right? Like we see that in the NFL all the time where, where guys come in and they catch fire and they do different things. So like, I guess I'm, I'm personally not overly concerned that if Mills had to miss time for whatever reason, that one of those guys, you know, wouldn't, would, would pop. Right. Like I just feel really? like, oh, yeah, I think Morrison or Scott or Tompkins or Johnson, like of those four guys, the chances that one of them are productive this year, if they had to be, I feel, you know, pretty decent about that just in, in terms of probability and numbers games and what they brought in. But you know, I might be wrong, but it, it just numerically they're in and depth wise, they're in a better spot certainly than last year. That's fair. I mean, that's, that's, that's totally, that's totally fair. I, um, now Mills only averaged 12 carries a game last year. He played in all 12 games, but so he can probably Harry, he, Diedrich Mills can run the ball 20 times a game. I, I physically yeah. he can do that. So you don't worry about him physically there. So the number two carry guy among the running backs last year was Wendell Robinson at 8.8. Now, if you add 11.92 to 8.8, you get 20.8. You can actually get, you know, you get like 20 point, 21, essentially. 
Diedrich Mills can probably handle, you know, um, 18 to 22 carries. I, I, you know, he, he can be that player. I think physically he can do it. I think he gets better the more he carries the ball. Um, he's going to have a couple of ca- tackle. He's going to have a couple carries for loss, but he's also going to get you a few plays that you might not have got otherwise if he wasn't out there. The question becomes is again, who do you bring on for the other eight, nine carries a game? And who do you bring on who going to, you know, especially on a third down because of what, what do you do there? Um, and yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think Marvin Scott long-term is going to be the best of that quartet, presuming that, I mean, I mean Tompkins is hard to tell if Tompkins is healthy, he might be the best. And that does happen sometimes. I mean, Frank Gore had numerous knee injuries and then rebounded to have an incredible NFL career. That's going to land him in the hall of fame. Um, but you know, if Tompkins comes back from those, then maybe he can do that. And that would be good. Um, if he doesn't, then, you know, then uh, I would say Marvin Scott out of that bunch is, is the guy that I'm most confident about. Um, what you worry about a little bit is that, you know, you, you're, you're in a situation where uh, Nebraska ran a little dry on running backs after they signed Amir Abdullah. Mm-hmm. Um, they missed on some guys. Um, you know, I mean, uh, Adam Taylor didn't, he didn't pan out. Um, he got hurt, but he didn't pan out. Mikhail Wilbon didn't pan out. Uh, Terrell Newby did to some degree. I mean, Terrell Newby was a pretty good running back in Nebraska, but um, you know, they, they, they had some, they had some players come through. Jalen Bradley didn't pan out. Um, you know, divine Zigbo when he was finally given the opportunity to do it the right way did, but it took him until halfway through his senior season um, to get there. Trey Bryant got hurt. Trey Bryant's kind of the Ronald Tompkins of this conversation. So Nebraska kind of had a run there where they, and of course, Maurice Washington, you know, flaked, flaked out, flaked and is no longer part of the program. I'm not sure he's playing anywhere. Um, you want to avoid that. And, and they've had a little bit of a run here. They had a great run for about 10 years of recruiting running backs, whether it was uh, Brandon Jackson or Marlon Lucky, who was a good player at Nebraska. Roy Hallou. Rex Bur- Roy Hallou, Rex Burkhead, Amir Abdullah, who was one of the best of all time at Nebraska. They had an incredible run where they were able to get one NFL back after another. I don't know if Lucky played in the NFL, but all the other guys did. And now they've been on a little bit of a dry streak. Um, you know, uh, since 20, whatever divine Zigbo has been the best guy since 2013 that they've had. Um, and maybe Diedrich Mills is that guy, but of course, you know, guys like Diedrich Mills don't come through junior college all the time because teams like Georgia tech with that ludicrous drug policy they had don't come around all the time. And if Georgia tech didn't have the policy it had, Diedrich Mills would still be there. <laughs> I would think. He'd probably be a fifth-year senior, and he or he would have graduated last year. Um, Mills is at Nebraska in part because of Georgia Tech's policy that almost no other school had at the time. So, and they don't have anymore. Um, so, you you junior college backs don't grow on trees. They, they they maybe they used to back in the Mike Rogier era, but they don't anymore. And so you don't you don't always find a Dietrich Mills in college. Greg uh, Bell. Exhi- Exhibit A, Greg Bell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I wonder about that position, and it's concerning because you have to have if, – if Mills gets hurt or goes down and you suddenly go from a guy that can average five yards a carry to 3.7 yards a carry, over the course of a game, that's two or three first downs you really might need. And they – you know, I mean, Ramir Johnson last year averaged 3.05 yards a carry. Now he only had 21 of them, but he had, he had a lot of them against Maryland. <laughs> so, yeah. you know – Maybe the <laughs> Maryland sucked. So, you know, <laughs> there weren't any 30 yard runs is my point. And then Wyatt Missouri, you know, I mean, he, he's gone, but he averaged 3.52 on the same number of carries. Right. Uh, so there's a little bit of, there's just a little bit of concern there. And that's maybe why you heard Held mention Cooper Jewett, because I think, Hey, you know, I think they're going to go with guys that know how to run the offense that they're running. And when you run that zone run scheme that Nebraska runs, you have to know how to run it. You can't just not know. You can't just run into the rear end of the left guard and say, well, you know, there wasn't a hole there. I mean, you can't do that. You mm-hmm. have to have patience and you have to have the footwork. And I love that Held talks about that. He certainly taught Divino Zigbo how to, how to perfect it. He taught Diedrich Mills and Mills got a hell of a lot better through halfway through last year at doing it. So Held knows what he's doing. He knows how to coach it. 
you just hope he's got the pieces there to be able to, you know, have a quality backup behind Mills. And, oh, by the way, a starter for the next several years after Mills leaves. I wonder if the question for the backup this year is so much about long-term potential and experience or if it's more about who's that change of pace guy. Because I agree, like what you're saying about Mills, uh, you know, he, he, he's that workhorse type who, who was just built to handle – you know, big carries and, and to, to do that most of the game. So like when he's not out there, you know, it, it seems to me like maybe what you'd want to do if you're in Nebraska is find that change of pace guy. And to Mills' credit, he kind of does a lot of things well. He's faster than I think he was given credit for uh, in, in short spaces. Certainly when he came in, he can bruise it up the middle. So I don't know who that guy is. Maybe it's Ronald Tompkins. Is that change? Probably Johnson because he's smaller and faster. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. You can run him on a wheel route beat somebody. I'm not saying that Ramir Johnson won't be a major contributor to this team. I'm saying that it's a little surprising that they haven't named him the number two guy. I mean, the, the guy, the other, the other guy that signed in 2019 spent a year rehabbing his knee and the other two are true freshmen. As so I would have figured that the guy that played last year would be the clear number two. He's not. So that to me is notable. It either means Tompkins is knocking it out of the park or Cooper Jewett's doing something special, or they just they just don't have a, a good number two right now. Yeah. I guess we'll find out. Um, we heard from the defense earlier this week. Uh, defensive line. We heard from two defensive, three defensive line. Yeah. Uh, Damian Daniels, DeAndre Thomas, and uh, Ty Robinson. What did you hear from those guys? What did you hear from Coach Tony Tuioti about that trio or just the group in general? Yeah, I mean, what I was curious about going in, I think we kind of had a general idea of what their rotation could look like. Um, you know, we, we knew Ben Silly was the senior, that he'd be the guy. Um, and they had a couple of experienced juniors in uh, Damian Daniels and DeAndre Thomas. Um, I, to, to me, it was who of the rest of that group stepped up to the point to where they could be reliable parts of that rotation because in that three, four that Nebraska runs, especially under two they want to rotate. They don't want to keep three guys out there the whole time, especially given the offense it's paired with, right? You don't want those guys out there for 85 snaps or whatever it might be. So the rotation is especially important. Um, so I thought it was notable. And two essentially said this, uh, that it was, it was Ty Robinson. It was Jordan Riley. It was Casey Rogers and it was Keen Green. He said those four guys, what they did in the offseason, uh, helped Nebraska feel comfortable mm -hmm. reloading this thing to seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and that was that's very key, right? Because we, we saw little glimpses last year, especially late against Wisconsin, when some of those guys were in there and it was not all that impressive. Uh, you know, no. Keen Green was in his first year learning the it wasn't good against. It wasn't good against Purdue. Right. Keem Green was still learning the defense. Ty Robinson was a true freshman. Uh, you know, Casey Rogers had been there just for a, a couple of years and was, was coming along. So I think that was really <clears throat> probably the biggest takeaway was, hey, these are some guys who can play some immediate snaps here this fall. Uh, Ty Robinson, we've seen the workout videos, kind of heard about what he's done. Everybody seemingly mentions him when you talk about the line and who's standing out there. So he's, he's pretty clearly taken a step and, and kind of validated what his recruiting pedigree was like when Alabama wanted him and some other top schools out of high school in Arizona. So, uh, you know, I thought that was important. The, the leadership component is a little interesting to me. Um, they made it pretty clear that this team vocally was Stillies and, and Damian Daniels and DeAndre Thomas's. Um, but, you know, those guys, I think uh, Stillies, Started a handful of games, mostly in 2018. Um, Damian Daniels still hasn't proven in games that he can, that he has the stamina to be out there for, you know, extended time. DeAndre Thomas has been hurt, was recruited for a 4-3. So, like, the, the upperclassmen, they've been here. Um, I don't know. It, it, I didn't hear that they were, you know, blowing the competition out of the water in practices. Um, you know, some names we didn't hear, didn't hear – uh, Tate Wildeman still, he was somebody who in the spring they had kind of mentioned. Uh, we didn't hear about Messiah Newsom, who's in the same class as Ty Robinson. So, you know, there, there were still some names that we didn't hear, but 
my, I guess my big takeaway was I felt like they really believe that they have seven guys that they can rotate through and given, especially the start to this season. Um, I mean, that's going to be key if you're going to have any chance to, to do what you want to do. Yeah, me too. I, I think they sounded reasonably, you know, buoyant, confident as they're going to be. I think there's a sense that you're going to have to do it in the games too. Um, sure. um, let's see what happens in the games. The guys that they didn't mention, Feldarius Payne has moved outside linebacker. Masai Newsom, Chris Walker, Nash Hutmaker, um, Tate Willerman, Marquise Black. Two of those guys are true freshmen. Hutmaker and Black. I don't think either one of them expected them to play a lot. Newsom's a redshirt freshman, and Walker is a junior, and Wildeman is a redshirt sophomore. So, uh, we'll see. We'll see kind of where things go with uh, with that crew. They also mentioned Colton Feist, who's a sophomore walk-on from UTAN. He was a great player in high school. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm still going to be intrigued. So I guess they resolved. We had talked about this over the summer. We had talked. We had talked about the Feldarius pain thing. How does this guy fit in with everybody else? Well, they've resolved that by moving him to a different position. Uh, what, essentially, sort of a. I, I'm guessing he's going to function like Alex Davis did last year. It's not like Alex Davis was was covering slot receivers a lot. So I'm guessing he's going to be a pass rusher, a guy that either puts his hand down or is right on the line of scrimmage. On. Uh, on third down, um, you know, he, he'll play a defensive end or, you know, a kind of a kind of a stand-up defensive end or whatever they want to do with him. But they kind of resolve that. And then you look at the other group, and I thought, you know, it, it seems pretty clear to me that Damian Daniels is one of the leaders. Um, he has his college degree already, uh, so he's, he's achieved something, I think, before he turned 21 years old, if you can believe it. Um, I think he's 21 now, but uh, he, you know, he's got his college degree already. He's, he's achieved a lot. He uh, played behind uh, Darian Daniels and then Carlos and Cool Davis, um, those two guys. And so I think he, he's been raised, so to speak, the right way by those guys. Um, and then you've been Stilly and DeAndre Thomas. And that seems like the, that seems like the front three to me. Um, the question you have with that front three is at times when they were inserted last year as the second team group, didn't always go great. And incidentally, they were paired with the exact same, the exact same linebackers they're going to be paired with this year. Uh, so Jojo Doman, Caleb Tanner, Will Honitz, and Colin Miller, all the same guys. So, um, you know, the first the first touchdown drive for Purdue, that was the situation. A couple drives at Maryland. Um, we'll just have to see how it goes. But, but I think they've got, you know, they seem like they're they're uh, better as uh, than they were last year. The players themselves. I don't know that they're going to be better than the Twins and Darian Daniels were. Um, Frost's comment about the outside linebackers on Thursday night show was really telling me. Uh, I mentioned the thing about the coaching. If nothing else, they're going to be taught how to coach. They're going to be taught how to do the right thing and hustle and all this other stuff. I was like, yeah, that's pretty telling. Um, and that that's that's pretty indicting. That's it's, it's suggesting that a lot of what happened last year with Nebraska's outside linebackers was bad technique, bad assignments. Um, not having not having eye discipline or basic responsibility discipline, and when you watch the games from last year, you see the outside linebackers making some really good plays, and you see them <coughs> ducking inside of blocks that they probably shouldn't, um, getting turned when they probably shouldn't, um, taking wrong pass, missing tackles, stuff that uh, I'm sure was very frustrating to Frost on a number of levels, and he feels like Mike Dawson's going to clean that up. Yeah. I mean, it's that position remains the thinnest on the team. I mean, you've got Doman, your senior, Caleb Tanner, your junior, uh, you know, Garrett Nelson was someone they put out there quite a bit last year as a true freshman, one of the few who didn't red shirt. Uh, I mean, beyond that, it's it, what I heard was kind of a list of guys that they, they hope and that they hope contribute, you know, Nico Cooper, they hope comes through. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't heard uh, David Alston's name really at all since he's been at Nebraska, but no. he's still there. I think Jamari Butler long term, maybe not this year, but long term, it could be one of those guys. Um, and I mean, 
Blaze Gunnerson, another true freshman with Butler, like he's he's been hurt. I don't know if he's someone who's in position, but that's that's the spot to me where man, you can't lose anybody out there, and you're really relying on those two guys being Doman and Tanner to to produce and to do anything. And you know, we talk about the misses at running back. I mean, think about all the guys that Nebraska's missed on at outside linebacker in the last two, three, four cycles, like just a ton of players that have gone elsewhere that maybe had Nebraska in their final two. Um, and so, you know, I think maybe that's part of the reason you move Feldarius Payne out there too, is just kind of like with Colin Miller a couple of years ago, it's just a, a depth situation. Like you need, you need uh, more outside linebackers than you do defensive linemen at this point. And, uh, you know, he's shown an ability to have that kind of quick, quick twitch, uh, pass rushing ability that you can't really teach that just kind of you have it or you don't. And, and Feldarius Payne has had that in his career where he's been. So, you know, maybe he's a guy who gives him a change of pace look, but yeah, I mean, that's what I heard is you've got your, your, your two starters. And then man, beyond that, you just hope they stay healthy and you hope somebody else steps up and surprises you. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great breakdown. Very fair. Um, yeah, they're going to do, they're just going to have to do the best they can. I think inside linebacker, which I think I'm going to write about for uh, Sunday. Well, I'm going to write about all the linebackers, but uh, really like what Colin Miller had to say. Like he, he just seems so much like a leader yeah. and the ability to talk about all of the players on the team and talk about what he's, what, what they're going to do better and what they're going to work on. And, you know, Mil- Miller, Miller was, was uh, played very hard last year, made some real nice plays. Wasn't perfect by any means. Uh, first year really playing that position, having to kind of take charge of it. Um, there were times when he was, you know, it was him and Will Honus on the field, and that's not the same as having Moberry out there. And, you know, there were times when when defense was getting in late or the coverage was kind of whatever, and, um, you know, the, the execution wasn't perfect. But uh, but Colin plays really hard, and he cares, and he's a leader. And, and so I, what I, I really liked what I heard from him because I think that guy sounded like somebody who's willing to – you know, and again, to be a vocal leader is to is to in essence um, accept the likelihood that people will criticize you silently and at times behind your back, because vocal leadership means that you're assuming a certain command that says I'm willing to say what I think, and uh, you know you're putting you're putting part of yourself on the line. There's so many people, including in football, that won't say anything and then three years later they'll be like well i didn't really like my experience because of this this and this or i thought this this and this but i never said it and that's you know so it it takes a a risk to be a vocal leader because it means that you're putting yourself out there um and a lot of people just don't want to do that they don't want to be that person because it, it it attracts scrutiny um but i appreciate that miller is willing to be that guy and, it, and and here's the other thing. I understand that Darian Daniels did that last year, and I appreciate that he did that. Um, good for him. He had a little bit of an advantage when you're that when you're that new to a program and you've played so many years somewhere else. People don't really have time to learn everything about you, and they don't have time to learn about all your weaknesses. You know, that's just how life is. I mean, we know you and I have and know each other a lot better than we did, you know, six months into working together. Sure, and. Colin Miller's been there for five years. I'm sure all of his teammates know everything about him, yeah. uh, you know, and, and for him to be willing to kind of step out and be that guy, uh, you tip your cap to that. You do. Cause it's, again, it's not an easy role and Frost needs more players like that. So he needs, and Cam Taylor Burt's that way too. Um, DiCaprio Boodle's that way. So they've got guys like that, um, but they need more of them. And, and I appreciated what he had to say uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, I don't have a a ton to add to that. I mean, I I agree. I mean, Miller, and kind of like you pointed out too, like he he spoke with authority uh, about the rest of the defense too and kind of what their assignments were. Like that's somebody who gets the total picture and not just kind of what his role is, but kind of what his role is in the context of the entire scheme. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, it'll be him and and Will Honus at that inside spot. Uh, I, I thought it was encouraging for the position that they spoke pretty confidently about their backups to Nick Heinrich and Luke Reimer and kind of what they've been able to do. That was, 
I think that's important because those are guys that, uh, you know, are going to be the future of this thing either next year or the year after that. So to kind of have them established as that, as that, uh, as those backups, uh, I think is, is pretty key too, and to watch and see what they do this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. No, sir. What, what's in store for next week? Um, I do know that, uh, I heard again this week that, you know, Matt Lubick has done a good job of streamlining and making the offense more efficient and, and maybe getting them to work on their base plays a little bit more, uh, so that they can, they, they perfect what the small package of things that they're good at and then expand from there. Um, I think that was an emphasis that they've had really since Lubick got there and they may have hired him with that in mind, uh, that he, he would be able to come in and kind of identify the things that Nebraska wants to do well and then hone and streamline those things and then, and then move on to some of the more exotic stuff within the offense. So, um, we'll just kind of see where it goes. Do you, does it feel like it's two weeks out from a season? I was, like are you, I was just going to ask you the exact same question. Like, it's weird, right? Like, we, we all kind of coped and made peace with the fact that Big Ten was postponing, and then they restarted, and all of our experience has been through a screen with Nebraska football. It's all been Zoom calls. It's all been done from home. I haven't been to campus since the day that uh, the Big Ten postponed. Uh, just to kind of get a, a feel for for you know what the campus was like at the time, so it's weird. And 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 not going to Ohio State, it's just uh, it's going to be a much different experience than you know as opposed to traveling, going to the game, getting the build up, and now waking up at my house and, and opening up my laptop and spending the day, I guess, chronicling Nebraska from from my basement. Like it's just a weird weird thing. Um, no, it does not at all feel like it's two weeks away. It still feels like, I don't know, we're just kind of talking to people and filling storylines. Doesn't it, it does feel weird. I don't know. How about you? Yeah, it feels different, you know, because football's already been going on. So that, that, that anticipation that everybody gets when everything starts at once, yeah. it, just, it just doesn't feel the same. I think for the players, it probably still feels a little bit the same right now. But when they get to those games and they're not able to, they're not able to have any fans or very few fans, and it's silent in that stadium, that's going to be different. Um, boy, they're gonna they're gonna realize how much they love football or don't love it then, mm-hmm. because part of I think part of big time football is that interaction with the crowd, hearing that, seeing uh, seventy thousand people stand up in unison and 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 scream and cheer. Um, being able to feel that energy, um, that's not going to happen. And, and um, they're not going to be able to feel the energy of the millions of people watching them on TV. So you're going to learn really quickly how much you just love the, the act of hitting and catching and throwing and special teams and kickoff return. They're going to learn that stuff really fast. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to tell. I, I, I tell you what, I think just watching games, I think Oklahoma's struggling. Mm-hmm. I think their quarterback cares. I can tell their quarterback cares. Um, he wants it. There's guys on that defense that care. I, uh, they're struggling. They're, they, don't, they don't look like the same, especially running the football. They just don't look like the same team. They don't look like the same program. They don't seem to have the same level of fire. And I'm not sure that Spencer Rattler, it's his job to get everybody fired up. That's a hard thing for a redshirt freshman to do. And so it's not, he, it's hard for everybody to rally around him. And so what I'm, what I'm kind of seeing is I'm seeing some teams around the country that haven't been able to figure that out. Um, Miami, which I still think will lose to Clemson has, they got some juice. You can see it. Um, not sure about some other teams. Tennessee, I think has it. Florida seems to have it. Alabama seems to have it. Um, you know, I don't know about LSU. We're going we're gonna to see. And they play another terrible team in Missouri this week. But, but LSU seems a little whatever about things. Yeah, I, Ar- Arkansas seems fired up, though. Like, Arkansas seems into it. Auburn doesn't. Auburn seems sleepwalking. They don't, they don't look like the same program they did last year they, at all. They played, horrible against, uh, they played horrible against Kentucky. They played really bad against Georgia. They, you can just tell there's some teams that don't feel it. Yeah, I agree. Like, as much talk as there's been about – kind of losing the home field advantage. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that Nebraska won't be able to pack Memorial stadium or at least have some fans there. It does feel like 
maybe what we haven't talked about enough is is just what we're saying like which teams uh want to play essentially which teams never kind of turned it off in the last month or two and clearly nebraska is one of those i mean we've heard it from coaches all the time saying they 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 told their players to keep preparing as if they were playing and right. you listen around the big 10 like minnesota that was not the case. Iowa, you know, Kirk Ferentz said they, they sent those guys home and said, get ready to play in January. Um, Wisconsin, I don't get the sense that that was the case either, that they wanted to or, or, or were, were prepared to play soon. So, like, it'll be really interesting to see what the value is for a team like Nebraska that, that came back early, uh, never really gave up on things. You know, maybe for a few weeks after the the announcement, there was some downtime and it was hard to stay motivated. But for the most part, it really does feel like when you listen to conversation in the Big Ten that Nebraska was maybe with Ohio State and, and maybe another couple schools um, was more prepared to keep this thing going. I'll be, I'm going to be fascinated to see how that translates here early in the season. Yeah, me too. You know, it seems fired up. Will Bolt. <laughs> Yes, Will Bolt. He he spoke on Wednesday. Kind Nebraska of a baseball coach for those people who don't know who he is. Midway through fall ball, we still don't know if there's going to be a red white series or scrimmage or how that might or might not look. We kind of got that that stream that streamed uh, scrimmage early in fall ball, but yeah, he spoke on Wednesday. Um, you know, my takeaway from that was that they really confirmed that they have some depth going on. Like they brought in 17 recru uh, recruits in some fashion this fall. They felt like they had guys, but you, he, he didn't know kind of how that would play out until you start going through the scrimmages, the live drills. And so it, it's, it's kind of with this backdrop of daily competitions and, and weekly competitions. And so they put these guys, they split up into teams, two teams at the start of every week, they have competitions for, for drills on defense and offense. They, they have live scrimmages later in the week. So there's constant competition. And I thought what Will Bolt said was really uh, pretty enlightening as far as, as a coach, you know when you have depth because you can just sit back and let these guys do their thing. Like he's not stopping practices because there have been a lot of mistakes. Uh, drill work isn't getting kind of dragged down by maybe the bottom of the roster that's that's struggling. Like they're they're just kind of doing their thing. They're grinding. Um, they have the ability to move some guys from infield to outfield uh, or around to different positions. Um, and so that that was just kind of confirmed for him in the first three weeks. Um, the, the the pitching he said was pretty dominant, and we didn't really see it since that first scrimmage and that was a weak point for them last year i mean their weekend rotation was uh kind of shuffled around the bullpen wasn't very good so i think it's a good sign that um, they feel like they have a handful of guys that could be weekend rotation types whether right. that's chance roach who's the uh, transfer grad transfer from new mexico state uh shay shanneman transitioning in from a from a reliever into a starter um, Cade Povich was probably their best starter last year. He's going to be back and he had a dominant summer and, uh, you know, they're building the bullpen too. I think Colby Gomez is probably ticketed for a back end job. He's a mid nineties, uh, velocity type guy. Spencer Schwellenbach hasn't thrown at Nebraska, but, uh, he could be an elite, uh, reliever for them as well as their starting shortstop. So, um, what I'll be interested to see as next season plays out is how <clears throat> deep Nebraska is relative to the rest of college baseball because everybody is going to be deeper because the draft was only five rounds last year because the seniors can return. So everybody's deeper. Everybody's feeling better about their team. But it does seem like where Nebraska has struggled the last handful of years, and in the, especially in the later seasons under Darren Erstad, was in that depth department. Maybe their Sunday guy uh, – you didn't feel great about or their weekends or the week, I'm sorry, their midweek guys uh, you didn't feel great about. And where you really saw it was in the postseason when you have these regionals and you have to play, you know, three or four games in a weekend. Uh, and, and the good teams, man, they have that depth. You go to a college world series, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, your LSUs, your Florida's, your teams like that. I mean, they're, they're pulling their fourth and fifth starters are pretty good arms. And so, how much closer can Nebraska get to that kind of remains to be seen. But to me, that was the biggest encouragement was like, man, 
they actually have some quality depth now. They feel really good about some freshmen like Max Anderson and Bryce Williams as infielders. Um, it's, it's really encouraging. And I, I really don't think it's, it's coach speak. Um, I, I think it's them bringing in their guys and saying, yeah, I mean, these guys are competing and, and uh, this could get pretty fun pretty quickly. Yeah. I've been, I've, I've enjoyed being a Nebraska baseball observer over the last five or so years. And I'll go to, I don't know, two, three, four games a year. Um, usually they're playing some trash team or a couple of them. Other times it's a conference tilt uh, that I don't think a lot of people will attend because I don't want to go there and be, you know, sardined in at a baseball game. That just seems sort of un-American, go to a baseball game and then have to be packed in there. Uh, but anyway, um, hey, I've always been struck by, like, the games are very loose for the most part. I mean, they, you know, even the games Nebraska's won are 13-7, you just you just don't get the sense that that they know how to they know how to shut shut a team down very consistently. They don't they don't have a lot of you know guys that can throw really hard and, and their defense is okay, but it's not spectacular. And they, you know they just don't put a bunch of zeros up on the board. Like they don't put six zeros on the board in a row. And I always go to a Saturday game. I'm not going to the Friday game when they're putting their best starter. So it's always a weekend game, and it's like they're down to their, you know, they're into their rotation a little bit. It's just not, it's just not a great look. And so if they, if they can get better in pitching, you know, they'll, they'll, what they need to do is start winning some games where they don't have to burn a lot of their, their bullpen arms to win a game 13 to seven, you know? And, yeah. You know, I mean, you've watched enough baseball to know too, Evan, that there isn't actually that much difference between, a game that a team wins six to one and 13 to seven in the sense that an offense could score 13, but it can also score six if it doesn't have to score 13, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, yeah. It's uh, it, it, it kind of remains to be seen how Jeff Christie, the new pitching coach will go about it. It was kind of, they were figuring out the rotation last year, so we didn't really get a great sense, but like how, what kind of run or what kind of leash maybe they want to give their starters. Like yeah. you, see, you see your programs that'll, that are totally comfortable with keeping their guys out there for a hundred, 110 pitches. And then you see some, uh, you know, that, that maybe go kind of the more modern day major league approach where you're, you're giving your guy four or five innings, maybe you have an opener. Uh, and then you, you just kind of piece it together from there. So uh, it does seem like Nebraska has the guys now to, go six strong. And I think in the college game, that's especially important, right? Because if you can go six or, or seven, ideally, then you're, you're going right to your set of man, right to your closer. And you can finish that thing out, save your, your middle relief um, for later on. And Darren Erston always talked about that, about this idea that like, if you can get past an opponent's like two best relievers, you're going to feel really good about the rest of the weekend because most college teams don't have, you know, more than two or three pretty reliable relief arms. And so that's when those games kind of get ugly on Saturdays or Sundays. That's where the midweek games can kind of get, you know, aesthetically, uh, you know, displeasing, if you will. Um, so, I mean, we'll just, we'll just have to kind of see how it goes. But, you know, they had a guy like Cam Wynn, who's, who was a guy who was in the transfer portal forever from Lincoln High, had gone to Texas A&M. I mean, he's a mid-90s guy. So, like, the staff, what I've been impressed with with this staff is that they haven't kind of gotten their one or two or three headline recruits and then filled out the rest of the roster. Like everything that they've done, and I've talked to most of these recruits that have come in, every everything that the staff has done has been very purposeful, has been very much about like where does this player fit specifically, um, you know, within what we want to do. They have a, a 2022 kid from Hawaii who, who said the only, and the, he said, the coaches told him this. He said, the only reason that Nebraska talked to me, talked to me was because I was left-handed and he felt like they needed, they felt like they needed some left-handed bats. So like, that's how detailed they're getting in terms of their roster composition. So it's been impressive. Yeah, it is. Suck some hoops for a minute. Um, we'll rewind a little bit. I think it was last, Wilhelm Breedenbach committed. Did he commit before our podcast last week? Yes. Okay. So I won't, I won't rattle that off again. Um, but Nebraska does have a little bit of new recruiting news in the sense that Trey McGowan's younger brother, Bryce, 
who is committed to Florida State, has reopened his recruitment. And Bryce McGowan's is a five-star, a five-star guard. And it will be very interesting to see if Nebraska can, um, you know, um, kick the door in here and, and make, make a move for this kid. Because uh, McGowan's got his immediate eligibility, which is good news for Nebraska's team this year. It's very good news. They, they wanted that. We're talking about a guy that averaged 10 points and four, three or four assists and a couple of rebounds at Pittsburgh as a true freshman and sophomore both seasons. So the kid's legit. He's playing in the ACC. Pittsburgh's team was better than Nebraska's team last year. They weren't perfect. I think they went 15 and 17 or 16 and 17, but they weren't bad. Pittsburgh was okay as a team. Uh, they had the other guy they had was the guy that Nebraska lost out on, Xavier Johnson, I think was his name. He would have really helped Nebraska too. But McGowan's is a legit player, legit Division I player, got it done at Pittsburgh in a really good league. So they added him. They got him for an immediate eligibility. And now Bryce McGowan's is up for reopening his recruitment. He was committed to Florida State, which has been pretty good over the last three, four years. Uh, one of the better programs in the ACC recently, Leonard Hamilton, has long done a great job there. Um, and they've, they've generally recruited some players, too. I mean, Florida State usually gets a five-star every three, four, five years. Uh, and McGowan's was there. He opened his recruitment, I think, uh, this week. And, you know, everybody flooded in. This was yesterday. But Nebraska is one of those schools, and Nebraska has a legitimate connection to that. I mean, it's not, it's not a, you know, a random. It's his older brother's playing there, and his older brother is going to play a prominent role at Nebraska. And, oh, by the way, Bryce McGowan does not have to sign with anybody in November. He was probably going to uh, if he had stayed committed to Florida State, but he's not going to sign. He doesn't have to. And he could see how Nebraska's season plays out and then make a decision accordingly after that. And so uh, we'll see if, if, if Nebraska is able to get into that action. Technically, they only have two seniors, Nebraska does, so they'd have to figure out another scholarship. But, but that always happens. And Trishan is annual and constant, and you always expect players to be in and out. So that wouldn't be too much of an issue for the Huskers by the time it needed to be an issue, if that makes sense. Um, That'll be interesting to watch. He's he 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 he's a friend of uh, another current Husker, Elijah Wood. Not to be confused with Frodo. Uh, so we'll we'll see. That hasn't always gone. Now to be clear, that those those connections and relationships haven't always gone Nebraska's way in the past with family stuff. I mean, some kids make their own decisions, but um, it'll be interesting to watch. Obviously, Nebraska has not had a five-star recruit in the recruiting service era. Um, they absolutely did have one when they got Andre Woolridge, but that was not in the recruiting service era. Uh, and then they, they acquired a five-star uh, via transfer in Isaiah Copeland. And actually, I thought Isaiah Copeland played like a five. I mean, he was good. Isaac, Isaac, Isaac Copeland, sorry. Copeland played like he was a five-star. He was a good player. He was a really good player. Um, and Woolridge did too, but way back in the day. I think Woolridge was like one of the top 10 players in the country, so he was a five-star. They just didn't you know, delineate it that way back then. But Nebraska has not signed a five-star at a high school in the, in the recruiting service era. They might have a chance at this kid, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch. Certainly Fred Hoiberg knows how to recruit. And there, there's nobody questions his ability to acquire talent. It's it's a question now of can the guys stay healthy? Do they get along with each other? <laughs> and uh, can they put it all together? And the the getting along piece seems to be there. I mean, the players seem to say they've got real chemistry. So um, now you got to hit shots and all the rest. But I think everybody expects Nebraska to be a heck of a lot better this year. Uh, McGowan's is a is a big addition to that. Might be a starter. Started for two seasons at Pittsburgh. And again, those Pittsburgh teams were uh, that well, last year's Pittsburgh team was better than last year's Nebraska team. So that'll be something to watch. Uh, the bubble, which is being called the Golden Window by the uh, by the company uh, that's that's running at Elevate Hoops, um, there were some names that were leaked out um, by John Rothstein, I think, by CBS Sports, LSU on that list, um, some other schools, Cleveland State, Nevada a few others uh, that'll be part of the golden window. And then Oklahoma state announced it themselves. They're like, we're going, we're going to the golden window. Donovan Williams coming home. So um, 
he's a Lincoln North Star grad who went to Oki State, uh, was committed to Nebraska. I don't think he and Nebraska kind of saw eye to high. I think it was best for both parties, to be real honest with you. Um, but they're going their, they went their separate ways, and, and, and uh, Donovan ended up at Oki State, and now he'll, he'll play the first game of his collegiate career in his hometown. Mm. Might even play it on the PBA floor. That's entirely possible. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if it were. And I think that's – is that – yeah, I think that's the last place he played his last high school game. I don't know. Uh, no, I don't think they made it out of districts. I can't remember. I'm, my memory has been shot by the pandemic. Uh, but, so, you know, Donovan will be playing on that PBA floor where he, you know, he, I think, won North Star's first state tournament game there. Maybe they'll be at Devaney. I don't know. One or the other. Uh, and it would not surprise me if Nebraska is able to nab some other, some other named teams as some of these events get canceled. Um, you're going to see Nebraska be able to provide, uh, especially to programs in the Midwest, a, a safer environment um, that's also, you know, got the testing and all that stuff, and you're not having to deal with uh, traveling to other countries. Uh, a lot of those, I think, are going to get canceled, and, and you're, not, you're not dealing with having to try to co- contend your tournament on a campus where there's five other tournaments going on at the same time, which is kind of what ESPN intends. Like, and, and, and I wouldn't want that either. I wouldn't want – my tournament to be <laughs> like the fifth tournament on the, on the rung, you know? So mm-hmm. I think it's possible that Nebraska will get some pretty sweet games out of this, out of this deal. And uh, they might get some good opponents. They're not going to play every good team that comes here. I don't think that's the, the goal. Um, they're, you know, Nebraska's pro- somebody's going to play Cleveland state and it's not going to be Northern Iowa. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Cleveland state's going to have to play a power program. Uh, to be here, and Cleveland State probably wants to. So Nebraska won't play, you know, well, our schedule is going to be Oklahoma State, LSU, and uh, Villanova. No, it's not going to, you know. They'll they'll give them a game, they'll give themselves a game in there where uh, where they'd be a, you know, double-digit favorite. So, uh, but it seems to be coming together. There's obviously a long way to go with this stuff because you have to jump through a lot of hoops, and, and those hoops are, you know, significant. But – Lincoln Lancaster County, and this this isn't a political statement, has done an incredible job of managing the coronavirus in uh, in the city of Lincoln. They, they've done an outstanding job. Uh, their team has been excellent, and uh, and they have done a great job of working with Nebraska, working with the city, and um, I think Nebraska would tell you that they've done a really good job, and 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 they've been very helpful partners in this process. And any, if you see what's going on right now for the California football team and the Stanford football team, they cannot even practice in their county because their county has not given them clearance or an understanding of what they have to do. That is on the county. That, don't tell me it's the coronavirus. The county can tell you, hey, no dice. We're not doing this. And they could have told them that two weeks ago. Go find somewhere else to practice because we're not doing it. They didn't. They, they haven't cleared that up for Cal as of today. And maybe they Cal practice this morning, but – but that's on the county, and and Nebraska's Lincoln Lancaster County has been so much better at that. Their data has been really good. They update their data every day. They have a lot of press conferences. They have a lot of they have a lot of press releases. I mean, you can't ask for more from that operation. So Nebraska has a huge advantage in that because I don't think all county part, I don't think all city county health departments are are operating on the level that Nebraska is. Uh, and Lancaster County is that way. Shall we do some picks? What's picks? All right, I'm 24 and 10. You're 21 and 13. We both went seven and five last week. Uh, all college. Now a couple of these games are in the weeds, but we got to do all college this week, so That's I cool. thought that would be worth it. You ready? Yes. We'll start with a good one. Oklahoma, Texas, Red River rivalry. Two struggling teams. Uh, yeah. Ugh. Man. OU. OU for Evan. I got to tell you, I, I just don't know. I don't know if Oklahoma's got it. Um, I think they're down in the dumps. I think Texas just is very good. Um, hmm, I'm going to go Texas. All right. <clears throat> First rivalry, rivalry I ever remember was 1984, and they tied. Last year's was a great game. 
Oh, yeah. There's been a lot of great ones over the years. But, yes, last year's was. The year before that was, too. That was uh, Dicker the Kicker. Dicker the Kicker was, was that little, Dicker was the Kicker years. last year? Yeah, two years ago. Dicker the Kicker. Man. Yeah, all right. But they're, oh, they're, they're all a lot of classics. One of the best ones yeah. is when both teams were terrible and they played to overtime. And yeah, it doesn't matter. But yeah, 1984 <laughs> was the first one, and uh, they tied. Right. I want to make sure I've got this right. And it was it was it was a it was a monsoon. Mm. And there the last play there <laughs> there was a play late in the game where it looked like they scored a touchdown and and or they maybe. Uh, Texas clear, appeared to score a touchdown and didn't, or I, I don't even know what the whole story was. But anyway, yeah, it was it was a tie. Uh, okay, Mississippi State, Kentucky. Yeah, which Mississippi State team are we getting? Uh, I'll take Mississippi State. Kentucky. Arkansas Auburn. Auburn. Boy, I don't know. They look like they look bad. Auburn. <laughs> Bama Ole Miss. I'll take Alabama. Yep. Virginia Tech, North Carolina. This will be a game. Yeah, well. UNC. I'm taking Tech. Florida State, Notre Dame. I'll take Notre Dame. Yeah, same. Presuming the game's still played. I think it will be. Kansas State at TCU. Hmm. 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 Yeah. yeah. At TCU. Okay. Gary Patterson Bowl. Yeah. doesn't matter, but yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, I'm going to go Kansas State. Wabash Cannonball? Uh, oh, I don't know. K-State. Texas Tech, Iowa State. I'll take Iowa State. Yeah, same. Miami Clemson. Clemson. Me too. Should be, I think it'll be a decent game, though. I, I hope so. Me too. Coastal Carolina at Louisiana. Lafayette. I'll take Coastal Carolina. I'll take the loss. Okay. Florida, Texas A&M. Hmm. Hmm. Florida. Thank you. Okay. I'll take Florida. Last one, Tennessee, Georgia. Georgia. Hmm. You're not thinking Tennessee. Tennessee. Oh, Mr. Contrarian today. All right. Oh, not, not too much. Is it really contrarian to put Texas over Oklahoma? I don't think it is. Oh, not that game. Oklahoma does not look – they don't look like it – they just don't look the same. They don't look like the same team that we watched for four years. They don't – they look out of it. They look like we don't really want to do this. And if they're – I don't think Nebraska is going to look like that. But you can tell – that Nebraska, the one of the advantages Nebraska has had is that they've watched teams that don't look like they want to be there, and they're trying to guard and coach against them. And um, that's notable. And I think, I think Oklahoma is the cautionary tale because each of the last two weeks, especially when they get to the fourth corner, they're like, F it, we don't want to play anymore. And they've played horrible, horrible fourth quarters in both games. Like they're tired, like they're lethargic, like they just don't they don't have that extra gear. Their offense falls apart. And so I'll be curious to see. And my sense is that they're they're gonna be ripe to they're gonna ripe be ripe to fall again. But I guess we'll find out. It'll probably be one of these deals where Oklahoma's up thirty one seven at halftime. Because Texas doesn't show up. And I think Lincoln Riley's a you know, a better coach than Tom Herman. And Texas just, you know, Waltz is in there in all arrogant and then they get blown out but you just i don't know i kind of feeling texas will win it because i'm not feeling it from ou all right well next week we'll be back now i'm going to take a small small vacation before 
uh, I go uh, to Ohio State. So I, we won't record the podcast next Friday. Uh, we may have to do it midweek. But um, I'll, I'm going to take a couple of days off right before the season because I had planned that for months before we even knew a season was going to come up. So um, we'll, pro- we'll probably tape next week around Wednesday or so, and we'll try to get some more voices on here just to see what the predictions are going to be uh, um, or what people's thoughts are going into the season. Outside of that, Evan, take care, brother. Same to you, Sam. Have a good weekend. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, everybody.